All right, the December 19th, uh, 2022 session of the Anne Arundel County Council is called to order. Please silence all electronic devices at this time. Please rise as we open up with uh, prayer. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we confess our dependency on you. Thank you for extending abundance, mercy, and protection to our country and our county. Every resource, freedom, and opportunity we have is a gift from you. We ask that you open our minds with wisdom and compassion so all people may be treated fairly with dignity. Open our ears to cries of, desperate, of the desperate and uh, powerless so cycles of poverty, disease, and abuse may be broken. Open our eyes to see how best to respond and open our hearts with courage to do the right thing, even when pressured to do otherwise. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. At this time, we have a special uh, presentation, and uh, Councilwoman Amanda Fiedler will take it from here. So I'm, I'm very excited to be able to share a little bit of District 5 and some exciting um, entertainment and talent that has taken place at the national level in the last few months. Um, music makes the world go round. I say that quite often. It brings us together when other things do not. Other things can divide us. But music crosses all generations, all ethnicities, all age groups. So I had the awesome experience of being part of Team Parajita. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Parajita is a senior at Severna Park High School who is with us this evening. So Parajita, if you wouldn't mind coming up here. <laughs> so Parajita made it to the semifinals on NBC's The Voice. Uh, but she's absolutely a winner, and I know that door closed, but I have no doubt that at least a half a dozen more are going to open. So when I say that music makes the world go round and we all have that in common, Sullivan's Clo Cove is a restaurant in District 5. They're reviewing parties every week, and you would hear the hustle and bustle of a restaurant, but when Parajita would get on to sing, you could hear a pin drop in the audience or in the restaurant. There were people in the restaurant that would say, oh my gosh, she just gave me goosebumps. I'd go to the grocery store and I'd hear Parajita's name in, in, in line. I'd hear, gosh, did you hear her uh, sing last week? And I did have a family member, and when I say my whole family was in, and I'm sure there are other council members who were also in on Team Parajita, I was sitting on this dais at our last meeting and I got a text from my mom that said, Parajita's coming to sing at the, after the next commercial break. I said, I'm in a council meeting. <laughs> Her response was, can't you call a recess? <laughs> so we could not, we had to move on with business, but I went home and I voted my 10 times. A lot of Anne Arundel County voted their 10 times. We are so proud of you. Your family is so proud of you. And I know that the citizens of Anne Arundel County are going to cheer you on in whatever you have in store for you. So this is a citation from the entire county council and I'm going to go ahead and read it here. This citation is presented to Parajita Pastola, whereas music in its simplest definition is the art of producing a pleasing sound. And whereas Parajita Pastola transcends the simplest definition and uplifts and inspires others with her music. And whereas Ms. Pastola is a phenomenal artist who will no doubt continue to bring joy to the world with her voice and who will always have fans in Anne Arundel County. Now therefore, now therefore, the County Council hereby honors and recognizes Parajita Pastola, one of music's finest talents, for her incredible achievements and wishes her continued success in her future endeavors. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. I don't know why all of 
our council meetings can't start like this. I'm like so happy right now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I wanted to bring up uh, at this time the administration. I think you all had something. Say it again. Oh, there she is. Okay. <laughs> Madam Secretary, please read the ethics statement. That's a very hard act to follow. <laughs> uh, the Ethics Commission has asked that I advise you that under certain circumstances, members of the public may qualify as lobbyists when they testify before the County Council. If so, the law requires that certain information be filed with the Ethics Commission. The Chair of the Eth Ethics Commission has asked that those who wish to testify in any form review the general information on lobbying sheet located on the ethics website under forms and publications. If there are any questions about lobbying requirements, please contact the Ethics Commission at 410-222-4413. Thank you. Mr. Greg Swing. Mr. Chairman. Honorable members of the council, good evening. Uh, I think I've met all of you. My name is Greg Swain, I'm the county attorney, and I'm here tonight just to tell you a little bit about our office and how we operate. Um, I've been the county attorney since 2018, was appointed by County Executive Pittman. Uh, prior to being appointed, I was a senior staff member of the Office of Law, um, and I came to the county in 2011, and prior to that, I was in private practice for about 20 years. So the County Attorney's Office and the Office of Law is um, one of our charter um, agencies. The um, duties of the County Attorney are set forth in the charter. It's Section 526 of the charter. And there are duties that are personal to the County Attorney and there are duties that are uh, performed by the Office of Law. So some of the things that we do and the main thing we do is we are the legal advisor to all county agencies. And that means we are the attorney for the county council as well as the, the attorney for the county executive and the county executive's office. We um, assist the council with drafting legislation. When, when there are council meetings such as this one, you'll always see a member of my staff here as, a, as the legal rep for all the bills that are, uh, before the council. We do a lot of miscellaneous things. We review every contract that the county enters into, which is about 3,500 contracts a year. We review uh, all the ordinances passed by the County Council for legal sufficiency. Um, and then we provide a legal defense to county agencies in the event that we get into litigation. So our Office of Law, uh, first of all, we're located at the Heritage Complex, which is over on Riva Road. Uh, we're in building 2660, which is and on the fourth floor. So we have 36 staff members, 22 attorneys, five paralegals, six legal secretaries, two administrative assistants, and an office manager. So 36 staff in all. And I think we have an excellent staff. We really do. We have uh, experienced attorneys, and they do a great job. The, uh, the way the office is set up is I am the department head. There are two deputy county attorneys below me, and that is Hamilton Tyler, who is our deputy county attorney for administration, and then Lloyd Blair Klossmeyer, who is our deputy county attorney for legislation. The office is generally divided into three sections. We have a litigation team, we have a, a human services team, and then we have a government operations team. 
So the government operations team are usually the attorneys that you folks will be dealing with. So um, our litigation team is led by uh, uh, Phil Culpepper. He is the supervising county attorney for litigation. There are eight attorneys, and they handle all the civil litigation that the county is involved in. And that includes personal injury type cases when uh, a county employee does something um, in the course of their employment and someone is injured, contract claims, we defend workers' compensation claims, which are claims brought by employees or hurt uh, with a work-related injury. Um, any action necessary to collect money that's due the county is handled by our litigation team. We defend the county in personnel claims and personnel matters. We, uh, the litigation team also provides advice on the Maryland Public Information Act and requests that have received both by council as well as other agencies. Um, and, and the litigation team also provides general legal advice on, on those types of matters, liability type issues. The, the human relations team is three attorneys. It's supervised by uh, supervising county attorney Kevin Outing. And our human services team represents the Department of Social Services. So they are very busy in court a lot. They li litigate things such as children in need of assistance claims, um, adult guardianships, termination of parental rights. And then, and then lastly, we have our government operations team. The government operations team is uh, supervised by Kelly Kenny, who is the supervising county attorney. And what the government operations team does is first they do code enforcement, which means any violation of our zoning code, building code, health code, critical area laws, um, we bring civil actions to enforce those code provisions. They provide regular legal advice mostly to our land use department, such as the Office of Planning and Zoning, Department of Inspections and Permits, and the Department of Public Works, and that is on a daily basis, in constant contact with those agencies. The government ops team also drafts the legislation for the administration, and often uh, at the request of council, we draft legislation for the county council as well. I say us because I was from the government operations team, so I lapsed into that sometimes. We, uh, as I mentioned, we also do contract review. So uh, all types of contracts, anything that involves the interest of the county, including our procurement and our purchasing contracts, the government ops team reviews those for form and legal sufficiency. As I said, it's about 3,500 contracts go through our office every year. We also represent county agencies before the Board of Appeals. Um, that's principally the Office of Planning and Zoning, the Department of Inspections and Permits, and also uh, the Office of Personnel. That includes any appeals from the Board of Appeals to Circuit Court and the other appellate courts. So usually the attorney who handles the Board of Appeals case takes that case all the way through in the event that there's an appeal. Um, the government ops team also provides advice on compliance with the Maryland Open Meetings Act. So that, those are our, our three divisions. Now, the county charter also allows us to hire outside counsel if it's an area or a matter that involves special expertise. So for instance, um, we have attorneys who work with us on bond issuances. We have attorneys that work with us on uh, union negotiations, real estate settlements. Um, and tax counsel as well. So in those instances, we'll hire an outside firm to provide us with legal advice as well. The Office of Law has also uh, uh, recommended and the county has brought a couple of affirmative actions on our behalf. You all have probably seen the opioid cases that have been throughout the country in the past six or seven years. We hire outside counsel for those cases and they're all contingency fee cases, which means it doesn't cost the county anything they simply get paid from whatever the settlement might or judgment might be. So currently we have uh, the, uh, the opioid case, which has already settled, and we just got the first, um, it's an 18 year payout. We just got the first payment for that. The, um, if you uh, are familiar with the Juul e-smoking devices, we also have a claim against that manufacturer, and that case is very close to settling. Um, it's not really the magnitude of the opioid cases, but that is close to settling and we expect it will settle within the next month. And then the last uh, affirmative litigation we have is our climate change case, uh, which is um, still in kind of bouncing back between state and federal court as that sort of works its way through the system. So the county attorney by charter is the attorney for the county. Now th there's three exceptions to that. One is the county council has legislative council, Matt Bennett. So 
he is authorized by charter. The uh, Board of Appeals has its own attorney to provide them with legal advice because the Office of Law is representing the agency before the board. And then lastly, the Personnel Board also has uh, an attorney who represents them. So one of the things that the Office of Law is always very aware of is that we provide representation both to the administration as well as the legislative branch. So we take great pains to maintain confidentiality with those relationships. So if we are requested by a council member to draft legislation or to give an opinion on legislation, that is kept confidential from the administration and, and the executive branch and vice versa. Uh, sometimes it comes, we'll get the same question from the council as we get from the administration requesting an opinion. They'll get the same opinion, but they'll get it separately and they won't know that the other side has even asked the question. So we do take great pains to try to maintain that confidentiality uh, throughout. So each member of the council has the right to seek the legal advice of the county attorney's office. Uh, once we provide that advice to you, it's up to you to decide what to do with it. So who do you contact if you have a legal question? So you can always contact me. Um, my email address, it's my name, Gregory.swain at aacounty.org. Laura Corby has my other contact information, including my cell phone, so you can email, you can text, you can call. Um, with specific questions, uh, with legislative questions, you're best served by directing those questions to Deputy County Attorney Lori Blair Plossmeyer. Um, Lori is not here tonight, but you will see her a lot because she comes to virtually every meeting. The, um, another person who you'll get very familiar with is uh, Supervising County Attorney Kelly Kenny. She works a lot on legislation as well. So those two are always available for a consultation or questions. Um, if you have questions about any of our litigation cases, Hamilton Tyler, who is our other deputy county attorney, would be the person to direct those questions to. So that pretty much concludes my remarks. Um, looking forward to the next four years. It's great to see your familiar faces and welcome to our new faces. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Well, definitely appreciate uh, the advice. I know in, uh, in my previous life, when I when I served in this capacity, uh, I've, I've known you for a number of years, and uh, you've always been sort of a straight shooter uh, with me. So appreciate um, that firewall that exists between uh, the, this floor and the fourth floor, um, uh, because I think that's important when it comes to, to trust. And so uh, we Absolutely. have every every right to have that that firewall in place. So Absolutely. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members. Thank you. All right, we will now transition to the uh, portion of the uh, Board of Appeals. There were. As, as many of you know, we uh, interviewed the applicants for the Anne Arundel County Board of Appeals, and you may recall that the Board of Appeals application was held open through this past Friday. And so we now have interview uh, 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 a few of these applicants that are here today. Uh, they're going to be uh, answering some questions and uh, sort of speaking about themselves as well. And so the County Board of Appeals is established pursuant to six, Section 601 of the County Charter. And again, it is, a, it is comprised of seven qualified members and voters appointed by a resolution of the County Council. I said this a couple of weeks ago, and I'll say it today, it literally is the second most important uh, decision we make uh, as, as council members, at least in, in my mind. Um, and so they have a significant impact in how decisions are made when it comes to land use in most cases, as well as other uh, uh, issues that impact a, a citizen uh, or voter. And so what I would like to do is call up uh, two of those individuals that have uh, requested to uh, have applied uh, for one of these seven positions. And so Mr. Uh, Rober, Donna, I'm sorry, Mrs. Rober, uh, Donna Rober and uh, James uh, Estep, go ahead and come forward, please. And Donna, you were first up uh, on the list. And so if you can, I guess, introduce yourself and then uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. County Council members, staff, and, and guests. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for giving me this chance to interview for a seat on the, on the Board of Appeals. Uh, my name is Donna Rober. I live in Crownsville, uh, formerly District 4, now District 6. Um, so uh, I'm a firm believer in public service. I uh, have served at the federal level for over 40 years. And I have been searching for an opportunity to be of service to the community. This, this position really appealed to me because it's really a non-political position. Um, it involves many different situations. 
and would involve teamwork, critical thinking, and decision making, all part of my past. It is an opportunity to serve in an area where I believe I could both learn and contribute. <clears throat> While I do not have direct experience with the kinds of issues that this, this board would, um, of issues that would come before this board, I do believe I have um, applicable experience. As a member of the US Army and then as a federal employee, I have served on numerous advisory, disciplinary, adjudication, awards, promotions, and planning boards. Each of these required reading and understanding rules, regulations, laws, and policies, and then applying them to the issue at hand. Teaming was essential to share thoughts, opinions, and interpretations, and then to come to agreement on a resolution. My years of work and experience as an intelligence professional could also be useful. Just, just for an example, I have often been called upon to um, find solutions to critical problems while remaining within both legal and financial constraints. Learning what was acceptable and normal, identifying the unusual or abnormal, and making informed decisions was a part of my everyday life. As I stated in my letter, my husband Ed and I bought our first home in Anne Arundel County in 1976. Um, we then were stationed overseas, sold that house, and moved back into our current home in 1982 upon our return from an overseas assignment. Our two sons were born while we lived here. They attended and graduated from Anne Arundel County Public Schools, and they have bought homes actually in District 6 um, and are raising their families in the county. Um, it is home to three generations of my family, and therefore it's very, very important to me to watch this county uh, grow and progress. I have watched the changes and growth. I know that it has not come without challenges. As we move into the future, I would like to be a part of the team that adjudicates those challenges that can not otherwise be resolved. I would very much like to be a part of a growing county that is fair and equitable, offers affordable housing, recreation, and safety for all. And I'm going to close now and not take five minutes of your time, but I'd like to thank you for the time you've given me. And I now welcome questions. Um, Ms. Ms. Rober, uh, the last group, uh, when they came up here to testify, they, we asked them a question specifically about uh, time commitment as well as the back, uh, there's obviously a, a caseload, a backlog of caseloads uh, that's pending sort of the, the panel's uh, review. Are you, do you see, foresee any issues with the time commitment that'll be necessary to one, either, either uh, cr carry out the current uh, duties uh, as well as maybe even um, um, sort of uh, increase the amount of times that you're meeting to, to remove that backlog? So unfortunately, I do have some vacation time scheduled um, coming up, but other than that, I have all the time that I could possibly need as a, uh, as a retiree and a grandmother who's on call to drive as, as necessary. Other than that, I'm, I'm right. available. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, the next person we're gonna uh, speak to is uh, Mr. James uh, Estep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the council. Uh, <laughs> forgive me, I'm, I've been on the road to recovery for a bit and my uh, voice is not where I would like it to be. So rather than speak for several minutes and almost hear myself, I will try and give you the uh, elevator version. Um, I've been a resident of Anne Arundel County since 2005, a resident of the state for all but six years of my 56. I am a proud Marylander and a proud Anne Arundel County resident. Um, I have spent time inside and outside of government and gotten to know its ways and winding paths for the past several years. So I feel I can bring a vital voice to uh, to the Board of Appeals and a, a good deal of experience dealing with the unusual and uh, circumstances which might arise. Uh, again, sorry, I just don't have much going uh, vocally today. I have five children, four of whom who have already been a part of the uh, Anne Arundel County Public School System and a fifth who is only two but will certainly be on her way. A proud resident of Odenton, formerly District 4 and still currently District 4, so I thank my Councilwoman, the Honorable Julie Hummer, for, uh, for asking me to attend. So. 
Uh, I think that's best if I stop now. Thank you. Did you say you had a, she was two? I have a two-year-old. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, bless your heart. And, and a 24-year-old. So. <laughs> Uh, and the same uh, to you. So you're uh, okay with the tempo that potentially could come with being and serving as capacity? I would be honored to serve, and I will certainly make myself available whenever necessary to, to achieve what the, uh, what the board needs. Appreciate it. Any questions from the other council members? All right. Well, thank you all uh, for coming up here and, and expressing your willingness to serve in this capacity. Maybe seated. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. We now have concluded uh, the delibera deliberations. Uh, for the Board of Appeal candidates, we will go through, get through more business, take a brief recess to make decisions, and we will vote on a resolution appointing the Board of Appeals later this evening. We will now open up our invitation to the audience. Madam Secretary, did we receive any submissions through the online testimony tool for this portion of the meeting? Uh, no, no, Mr. Chair, there was nothing received through the online testimony tool this time. All right, so we'll invite members from the audience who are here uh, to speak who have signed up uh, before the meeting to address the council briefly on any subject not included in the printed agenda. Uh, remarks will be limited to two minutes. So is there anyone from the audience uh, that would like to speak? Come forward. And after you finish that, if you could just state your name and address for the record. Yes. Please be seated. I'm going to let him seat here. And then Ms. Joanna uh, Golden, if you want to come forward. Mr. Warner, please state your name and address for the record. Um, my name is Joni Golden. My address is 333 Shetlands Lane, Glen Murray, Maryland, 21061. Good evening, County Council members. My name is Joni Golden. I'm a Title I math teacher and a parent in the Old Mill Cluster. I come tonight during the busy holiday season to give a supportive voice to a portion of Dr. Bedell's proposed budget for next year for the expansion of the Triple E program in the Old Mill Cluster. For years now, our cluster has been projected for triple E, and last year we were so close, with county council members agreeing to its value. However, we are still waiting. Other students in the county have participated in this learning opportunity for about six years, and experience exposure to learning the constitutes in your area will never be able to get back. Our high poverty schools typically equate to fewer background and community opportunities, and continuing to deny our students of this program only enhances that deficit. It's not equitable and it's a disservice to our students and our teachers who also I might add are missing out on planning time that other elementary teachers are receiving because of triple E. Our kindergarten readiness assessment data showed that kindergartners are not coming to school ready to learn and we need the triple E program to continue to fill learning gaps. In schools today, there is a push for career technology education, CTE, and this is, cannot all be done in an academic content area as we need real world exposure and language at all levels in order to meet the needs of the whole child. And just think about it, my school is a Title I school. We have a large number of students that are a year or more behind in the grade level standards. This past spring, I was able to join what other awardees of the Presidential Award for Science and Math Teaching in Washington, DC. The national team, as well as the other awardees at this event, were surprised that our county and our state did not offer this program for all students. My personal challenge is to find innovative ways to spread the awareness of the Triple E program to families in the Old Mill Cluster, as well as gather their supportive voices in order to receive what our children need. My challenge for you is to join us at Glenmurdy Park for a night of STEM on January 19th and to engage with our families. Please do not continue to pass on our future scientists, linguists, and activists. Thank you. Thank you. I have a flyer if you guys want it. I can leave it here. Thank you. Multiple copies. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, you come back to the table. <clears throat> Name and address for the record, please. Uh, 
My name is Francesco Restaino. I live at 1505 Stacy Lane, Annapolis, Maryland, 21409. You just call me Frank. And I am in District 5, if you don't know where Stacy Lane is, District 5. Thank you. Um, just, just as a side note, she's being kind when she says students are a year or more behind. I, I work full time up at Cat North, and we get students that are like three and four years behind. But that, I support what she's trying to do. But anyway, I came here because when I went to vote, I read a description of a, a referendum on extending the terms of the county council. And the way it was written was to limit the county council to no more than three terms. Well, 20 years ago, I was living in Anne Arundel County. And 20 years before that, I was living in Anne Arundel County. So I, I mean, I'm born and raised here. And I remember why Anne Arundel County did the first referendum limiting it, limiting it to two terms in 1992. I guess if I have any complaint, it's the way it was written. It would have been more honest and genuine if it had just said, hey, we want Anne Arundel County to vote for the county council to get one more term. So for you know, total term of 12 years, not the way it was written. And, and I know that's how referendums are written. I know that's how people write laws when they're sponsoring them to try to get them passed. It's, it's very, what's the word? Uh, you have to be a, a verbal gymnast to understand exactly what the law is trying to get to. And I, I just don't think that's right. I think we should be a little bit more plain English. So. Thank you, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Any item, or, uh, any council member would like to place on the agenda? All right. Can I get a motion to take five minute recess to finalize the Board of Appeals resolution? So moved. Is there a second? Second, Allison Pickard. Uh, the, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The County Council is now, um, sorry, we will now take a five minute recess uh, to go and discuss our resolution. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I did it.
session. All electronic devices should remain silent. May I have a motion that the partial reading of any bill, resolution, amendment to a bill or resolution or minutes constitutes the reading of the whole. Allison Pickard, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. Madam Secretary, please read the minutes of December 5th, 2022. The meeting was called to order at 4 p.m. by Ms. Radvian, Chair. The meeting was held in the County Council Chambers, Arundel Center, Annapolis, Maryland. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of December 5th, 2022? Allison Pickard, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, any opposed? All right, the motion carries. The minutes of December 5th, 2022 stand approved as read. Madam Secretary, please read the titles of any bills to be introduced this evening. Bill number 8922, an ordinance concerning capital budget and program, Board of Education security related upgrades, maintenance backlog, roof replacement, and upgrade various schools capital projects, supplementary appropriations. Bill number 9022, an ordinance concerning subdivision and development, adequate public school facilities, school utilization chart. Bill number 9122, an ordinance concerning Sherwood Forest Special Community Benefit District, approval of loan and assignment agreement. Bill number 9222, an ordinance concerning zoning, critical area overlay, RCA uses, nurseries with landscaping and plant sales. Bill number 9322, an ordinance concerning Board of Appeals, notice of zoning appeals, property address. Madam Secretary, please read the titles of any bills to be introduced this evening. Uh, resolution number 5022 uh, will be voted on this evening as well. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I will read the title of resolution number 5022. Resolution number 5022, resolution appointing the members of the County Board of Appeals. So uh, we've, over the last couple of uh, weeks, uh, certainly uh, each of us have taken uh, a painstaking sort of review of folks that we think uh, should be appointed to this. And uh, before I read out the seven names that we have chosen to appoint, uh, is there any council member that would like to say anything about uh, uh, this resolution? Um, yes, I just, I just want to thank everyone who applied. Um, I think I, uh, my fellow council member will all um, echo that if we were very impressed with all the applicants and it was great to have so many to choose from. And I know that they will do a good job and everyone who is not appointed we will be calling on you to do other things because we appreciate um, your willingness to serve and all the expertise that you bring. So thank you all. Thank you. So be it resolved that the County Council of Anne Arundel County, Maryland, that it hereby appoints the following persons to the County Board of Appeals with terms uh, beginning December 20th, December 20th, 2022. For District 1, Lade Akin Balaji, for District 2, uh, Mr. Tony Labartina. For District 3, Darren or Mike Jacobs. For District 4, Mr. James uh, Estep. For District 5, Mr. John Fury. For District 6, Mr. William Dax. And for District 7, Mr. Phil Bissett. Is there any other business to be brought before this county council at this time? Are we going to vote Mr. on that Chair, resolution? Yeah. All right. So we're going to discuss the uh, the work sessions, correct? Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Yeah. Oh, you're right. I'll bring <laughs> you're all right. <laughs> can I have a motion? To <laughs> can I have a motion to vote uh, to approve uh, resolution 5022? Mr. Chair, how about if may I make a suggestion? Yes. How about if you allow me to read the title of the resolution one more time? Check. And then ask me to call the roll, and I'll call the roll. Got it. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. Uh, resolution number 5022, resolution appointing the members of the County Board of Appeals. You ready for me to call the roll? Yes, please call the roll. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Ms. Hummer. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Ms. Ledbetter. Aye. Mr. Smith. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Resolution number 5022 has been adopted. All right, this time, is there any other business to be brought before the County Council at this time?
work session. Okay. Did you want uh, to talk about the work session? I did want to talk about the work Let's session. Let's talk about the work <laughs> session, Mr. <laughs> Uh, so for those that aren't aware, the county council has two specific meetings that they have to uh, uh, sit in each month. That's the first and third Monday of each month where we vote on le legislation. But there's also an opportunity for us uh, the second Tuesday uh, of each month where we actually sit down and we discuss uh, legislations. We bring in experts who are um, uh, proficient at whatever legislation or area of expertise that we're looking for and they discuss with us uh, some of the pros and cons when it comes to legislation. Part of this discussion is to determine whether or not uh, we are going to continue to hold those meetings or what frequency uh, we're going to hold those meetings uh, for the, the, the second Tuesday of the month. Uh, it's, it's not something that it's, it's something that the public can attend. In the past, we've done uh, virtual sessions as well over this previous term due to COVID. And so at some point, uh, we'll probably come up with some mix between in-person or virtual or whatever this body uh, decides. So is there any sort of input uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, work sessions from any of the council members? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Picker. Thank you. I certainly value work sessions. I'm, I'm comfortable with the second Tuesday of the month. I'm also um, open to either in-person or virtual. Uh, virtual can uh, be beneficial for not only the council who work during the day, and it's, but it's also convenient for the administration to bring folks onto a Zoom. But I'm, I'm happy to be. Um, I can make myself available in person as well. So I'm open. I do think they definitely need to happen. Um, I, I don't know how other, other people feel about it though. That's my two cents. And for the members that were on here previous during the COVID uh, session, uh, was there any sort of issues with the virtual when you guys were discussing or gals were discussing uh, legislation or bills or anything like that? No. Pretty fluid as yeah. far as technical issues uh, that, that would come up well, there's always technical issues when anybody's on a Zoom, <laughs> uh, you know, whether you've upgraded recently or um, no, there can be there can be issues um, depending on where you are and, yeah. and your Wi-Fi connection. But um, like I said, I'm open to in person. It, it works with my schedule, but I, I'm, I can't speak for the, the six of my colleagues about yeah. virtual or I'm open to keeping it fluid too. like sure. January. We could have snow and we could still hold our work session if we had planned for it to be over Virtual. Zoom versus in person. We don't have to get out onto icy roads. Just one of my, just a thought. Mr. Volke? Yeah, thank you, Madam, Mr. Chair. Um, so used to Madam Chair. <laughs> um, so uh, I would say, I think work sessions are extremely valuable. I think that we have found them to be extremely valuable. I think that the second Tuesday of the month in the morning is something that many of us uh, have already built into our schedules. So for me, that works perfectly. I like that. My preference is strongly that we do them in person. I just find it to be more productive to have everybody together. Um, while we have done them virtually, and I give kudos to the county staff who have worked wonders to try to make that happen for us, I do just enjoy being in person. I like all of you. I like to see you. <laughs> Ms. Hummer? No, nope, I'm open for either one. I like the flexibility that working around weather or changes in COVID status or something that we have virtual, but I'm with Mr. Volke. I always prefer in person when we can. Ms. Fever. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes to keeping the work sessions. They are invaluable. Tuesday works well, and I, as Mr. Volke said, already built into the schedule. I think in person with the option to do virtual if there's inclement weather. Uh, but in person being the number one for me. Madam Lothian. This may be a question for Madam Secretary. Um, in terms of public notice, if we wanted to, you know, if we did have inclement weather, how far in advance would we need to provide notice of a shift from in person to virtual, for example? So I will tell you the terminology that we use, and then it will certainly uh, go to the attorneys for any further interpretation. It's reasonable notice. And we have been advised in the past that we can accomplish that by getting an, a notice on the website as soon as possible. Um, and again, I will just point out there's no public participation in work sessions. It's between you and the administration. And so, um, so perhaps you know it, there's less of a harm done if we can't get that notice. Um, on the website as soon as we might like to. Thank you. Um, I, I certainly have a preference for in-person, but I have to admit sometimes um, having them virtually did make it 
easier for me to attend um, due to just scheduling conflicts. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'll say I'm fine either way. <coughs> Is that better? Uh, I agree with my colleagues, uh, Mr. Volke and Ms. Fiedler. I do prefer in person. I think there's a certain chemistry um, and you're able to build when we're able to meet in person. The more opportunities we have to do that, the better. Um, that being said, the ability to pivot, um, knowing that we can do so to be virtual in the event of inclement weather, I would certainly, that's preferable than people being out on the roads and you know, risking their personal safety to have a meeting. Um, so in person, virtual when necessary would be my preference. Mr. Barron. He, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I may. I do. Uh, good, <laughs> good, good to see you. Um, just uh, because the work sessions do involve the administration, I just wanted to pop up and, and give our preference. Administration strongly supports the work session. Obviously, it is the council's prerogative. Uh, what we do ask that they're consistent on the same day uh, and some regular notice for our folks. We always try to get all the department heads or relevant experts in a department on particular pieces of legislation. So it can be a little difficult to schedule if they were to bounce around. So I think we're, we like the Tuesday. Um, it's always easier for me to get more people virtually than it is in person, but understand that the choice is the council's prerogative. So I just wanted to get that on the record that we strongly support work sessions. Okay. And, and um, if I may, uh, what, which months are we not doing? So August is one of those months and May? The so month of May, yes, because you're usually doing budget meetings. And then the month of August, we do not schedule work sessions because that's a recess unless the council decides differently ahead of time. May, August. Uh, would the would the council be open to, uh, and I think um, district, as far as the inclement weather, I think that's valuable added. Uh, I'm certainly enjoy the flexibility between uh, in-person and uh, virtual, uh, but since we already have the May and August, would December be a good month just because it's a holiday season? Uh, a lot of things are going on. Would, would the council be okay with that being a virtual in advance, a virtual uh, meeting, but every the, the Tuesday of, second Tuesday of every month, same time, same location, um, but um, uh, December being potentially one of those months where we do virtual. December or January? I'm, I'm actually, I could do either or we're both. Past, we're past the second Tuesday is all. Correct, oh, for future. You're I'm talking about for future. all December is going future. forward. Correct. Mm. Mr. Chair, may Is I suggest yes. that we cross that bridge um, when we're a little closer to it? Okay. For December, but maybe... Um, I don't know if folks have a thought on January. Any thoughts on January? In person. In person. In person. All right. Sounds like it. In person, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as it stands, we will continue to meet the second Tuesday of every month uh, here in the council chambers. Uh, and May and August, uh, we will not meet. And depending on inclement weather, uh, we will potentially uh, transition to virtual and we'll ensure that the public has adequate notice uh, of that, that transition. Mr. Barron. Just one more point of clarification. What time, sir? So we usually attend, it's at 9 a.m.? Uh, so 9 a.m., it's 10 a.m. before. <laughs> so 9 a.m. it is. All right. Uh, before we end, because uh, I was getting ready to make this other uh, comment, uh, I do want to say it has been a pleasure in the year 2022 uh, to serve with the seven of you all. And so this is our last council meeting uh, before Christmas. And so I just want to say happy holidays uh, and, I, and, and, and Merry Christmas to all of you. And I, I hope that 2023 brings uh, much joy to Anne Arundel County. And if you all want to say anything, you know, please do. This is the last council meeting uh, for this term. All right. All right. Uh, may I have a motion? Oh. I just wanted to um, wish anyone celebrating Hanukkah, happy Hanukkah. And of course, Merry Christmas and to all a good night. <laughs> <laughs> motion to adjourn. The motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? All right, motion carries. The county council is adjourned until January 3rd, 2022. Happy holidays and happy new years.